Welcome to the Warriors of Light podcast, where we interview other Warriors of Light, people who are up to big things and making a positive impact in the world. Today, we are interviewing Sri Prediji, co-founder of Ekam in India. Enjoy the show. And as we bring in Sri Prediji, um, I am really, really so divinely grateful for um, her presence on the planet, for who she is and for the mission that she's been on. Tony Robbins talks a lot about this oh, idea yeah, of beautiful. living in a beautiful state. And there's so many people that live in a suffering state, feeling disconnected or afraid or fearful. Mm-hmm. And, um, and Sri Pridiji and and her beloved like really teach this principle of how to live in a beautiful state no matter what's going on. And um, it's such a beautiful theme. And for those of you that haven't yet, make sure you get her book, The Four Sacred Secrets. It's just it's such a beautiful thing. And um, so much wisdom and light is transfused through that. And so uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to Sri Pridiji. I'm glad to meet your community and your friends. It's so beautiful. Today, I will share with every one of you about the power of a beautiful state, a no suffering state. What Sri Krishna Ji says, Krishna Ji is my husband, he's the founder of Ekam. What Sri Krishna Ji says and shares with the world that every one of us at any point live in only one of two states. One is a suffering state or a stressful state. The other is a no suffering state. A suffering state is any state in which you experience an inner disturbance. It is not limited to sadness and sorrow alone. It is fear, irritation, frustration, guilt, loneliness, sadness, insecurity, uncertainty, depression, jealousy. Any state in which you experience an inner disturbance is a suffering state. And the no suffering state begins with a beautiful state. But of course, I I hope your journey does not end with a beautiful state. Then it continues into you experiencing the transcendental states. And then finally, the enlightened states. The journey of every seeker should be to live, to begin to live in a beautiful state. While the journey should not stop there. Your journey should continue until you have found enlightenment. Sri Krishna Ji says that any point in time, you are living either in a state of suffering or a state of no suffering, and there is no third state. That is why the most important decision of your life is from which state you are going to live and experience your life. From which state are you going to parent your child? From which state are you going to create wealth? That becomes very important. But you know what universal intelligence is, intelligence is, and you know what state is. I want to go through the laws of intelligence, the laws of consciousness. The first law, the first law of consciousness is that your state is the signal that you're sending out into the vast, all pervasive fabric of consciousness to draw either chaos or to draw order into your life. If you are living in suffering states, it means you are signaling this vast universal consciousness that you are open to problems, you are open to chaos. If you are living in no suffering states, definitely it can begin with beautiful states. 
it means that you are signaling co the consciousness, the vast field of consciousness, that you are open to solutions, that are open to order. So the first law is in consciousness is that your state is the signal you're sending out to the vast, all pervasive fabric of consciousness to draw chaos or order in your life. You may get trained in speaking very sweet words and also probably you have the control to perform dignified behavior all the time. But if your inner state is screaming of suffering, please know then that is what you're communicating to the universe. You are signaling to the universe that you're open to chaos, that you're open to problems. Similarly, when you are in a no suffering state, when you begin to experience life from a beautiful state, you are wordlessly communicating to this fabric of consciousness that you are open to order, that you're open to solutions. I want you to understand very clearly that this is a living universe. It is a conscious universe. There is an immense communication happening all the time within each life form, there's communication happening from one life, to, life form to another life form. There's communication happening from various life forms to the whole. If this entire universe is communicating, how are we communicating to the, to the vast field of consciousness? We're not communicating through our words alone. We're not communicating through our actions, through our behaviors and mannerisms alone. We communicate to this vast fabric of consciousness through our state of being. Let me share a story with you. In one of the field of awakenings that happened in Mexico City a couple of years ago, there was a young YouTube YouTuber. Um, he, he, he came from Colombia. He was longing for a personal experience of what I was speaking. And on the second day during a deep immersive mystical process, he kept remembering his father who had abandoned him when he was six years old. And he cried uncontrollably because he had, he had, he had felt that lack of having a dad in his life. And during the process, he also saw how isolated he had become in life. He has millions of followers on YouTube, but he doesn't really connect with anybody. There are no real friends. And he was also very clearly able to see the anger that he was holding against his father. He, had a, he experienced a powerful liberation of that anger and that loneliness. And in the Diksha, the transference, the divine transference that happens, that happened that evening, he moved into a powerful state in consciousness, a state of a total absence of thought. That state came uninvited to him. It was an enlightened state. It was there with him for about 30 minutes during the diksha and after, after that as well, and then left him. And that very evening, his mother sent him a message and when he clicked and opened it, he saw an image, a picture that his mother had sent. It was a picture of his, of his child, sorry, of him as a child, and then his dad and his mother. It's a picture when he was around six years old, all of them sitting together as a family and having a meal. 
So immediately this young man calls up his mother and says, where did you find this picture? I've never seen it earlier. And the mother says, your dad just called me up and he sent this image. He had called her up after several years. And he inquired very lovingly, very dearly about his son. When you go beyond the mind, when you go into the realm of consciousness, I want you to know something incredibly mystical unfolds. It is beyond logic. If your consciousness undergoes a transformation, your transformation can impact someone else. A transformation in your heart can desire, can create a heartfelt desire in somebody else. A transformation in your heart can create synchronicities and miracles thousands of miles away from you. Also, if there is a true transformation or true liberation from anger or letting go of selfishness, it can impact entirely different area of your life. It can impact your business. It can impact your career. If in your consciousness a huge roadblock is released, not in understanding, not in just an intellectual idea, I'm actually talking about a release, a, a liberation, a freedom that you can experience, then abundance begins to flow into you unhindered. I want you to know very clearly we are a part of a living universe. Let us now look at another law. Let me share with you another law. Effect precedes the cause in the world of consciousness. Let me explain this to you. The light falls on the screen and your image is captured by my retina. Then there is a series of processes that happens in my eye and the brain. And the result is, I see you. There are so many causes. And finally, the effect is, I see you. What if it, the whole thing happens in another way? First, I see you in my consciousness. There are numerous processes triggering in my brain. Your image gets projected on my retina. And then the light hits you. And finally, you emerge. It's the reverse order, right? That is, the entire scene is being played backwards. Say, there is a glass over here. I push the glass because of which the glass falls down and breaks into pieces. There's a cause and an effect. What if the glass broke into pieces first and then it fell down and then I push it? Let me explain this in terms of your experience of consciousness. In an ordinary sequence of cause and effect, this is how life would appear to you. That is, you land on a dream job, which is the cause, which leads you into feeling fulfilled. This feeling of being fulfilled is the effect. And then the external is the cause, and your state is the effect. Take another example. You connect with your soulmate. This is the cause. And this cause would lead you to an explosion of love in your heart. The external is the cause that is finding your soulmate and connecting with her or him. And the state of love is the effect. And this is how we assume as to how life unfolds. 
but the reality of how things unfold in consciousness is very different. It is actually like watching the movie backwards. That is, you awaken to an explosive state of love, then your soulmate comes to you. You live in a deep state of fulfillment, then your dream job comes to you. I want you to realize that your state is the cause and the synchronicity that unfolds thereafter is the effect. Same applies for suffering states too. So you have a path towards finding solutions. You have to look at the path of dissolution in order to process change. The path of dissolution is the path of insight. Dissolution begins with the insight that regardless of your life circumstances, you can be at peace. No matter what circumstances your you can your life throws at you, you can still live in a state of imperturbability. No matter what changes happen around you, you can still live in a state of equanimity. But what usually happens when a change happens around you, something that you don't want to happen, the two common states that you experience is frustration and anxiety. That is how an unenlightened being experiences an unfavorable change. And these are suffering states. To move into a no-suffering state, you must learn to dissolve these suffering states as and when they arise. And this ability to dissolve suffering states is one of the foundational steps on your journey towards enlightenment. Not all people's anxiety, not all people's frustration are the same. There are three spaces from which anxiety and frustration could arise. Your anxiety or your frustration may arise from your samskaras or vasanas. Samskaras are deep impressions in your consciousness because of the experiences that you've had from your mother's womb, your childhood, or in your later years. Vasanas are, of course, those impressions that are flowing in from previous lives. The second space from which these two suffering states may arise could be from your parents or your grandparents. It could be an inheritance from your previous generations. See, if one of your parents or your grandparents were prone to chronic anxiety, they did not dissolve it in their lifetime. There is every possibility that it has been passed on to you. If these are the sources, then you may feel anxious even without knowing why. Or you feel like something just happened that pushed you into frustration, but you really do not remember the causes of anxiety. The third source of anxiety or frustration could be because of the current problematic situation. If this is the case, if it is because of a current change that you're facing externally, that you're moving into anxiety and frustration, then you can walk out of it easily. Of course, you have to be aware of it. If not, your suffering states of anxiety and frustration can become addictions. If you do not learn the art of ending them quickly. In the field of awakening, 
that happened this year. A four day retreat that I lead seekers through all over the world. I lead seekers through liberation of one of the most destructive dimensions of their mind. People experience liberation from three different dimensions of the mind. One of it is the karmic mind. The karmic mind is that mind which flows to you from your ancestors. The karmic mind is the mind that flow from earlier lives, that is, from your parents. Karmic mind means past mind. It flows from your parents. It flows through your experiences that you've had at the moment of conception and from your own experiences that have unfolded in your life till date. This karmic mind pushes you into unconscious action. It makes you fall into patterns that are destructive. It keeps you in a loop of growing you in unhappiness and struggle around life. Let me talk to you about a woman who attended the field of awakening. When she was young, she was a topper in college. And when she was in her late teens, her very conservative father convinced her to get married to a, a wealthy person. And that is all we knew of her until she came to the field of awakening that happened in Mumbai. On the second day, she stood up and shared her experience with me. She stood up and there were a thousand people over there and she wanted to share. She said, I'm not a great orator, Pritaji, but have a very grateful heart at this moment I want to speak. She said, three years after my, my marriage, I was depressed. Then I had two children. My husband is not a bad man, but he's just insensitive, does not connect and does not feel at all. And one day I developed a, a facial paralysis. That is, one side of my face dropped. She said, after, after that, over the years when she did try to speak, she would drool. And it, she said it was so embarrassing. She felt so terrible about it that she stopped speaking or she, she spoke very little. She said, for years I fought with God for what had happened to me. And only yesterday in the process I realized that this is my karmic mind that has got me trapped. She saw it was a divine revelation. She saw that it was a repeating pattern in the women of the family to marry men who they don't love. And the pattern has been that they live with that discontented consciousness. And during the process, she also discovered that she had inherited hate for men. She had inherited shame around her body as a samskara from her ancestors. She said in the process, she felt the divine enter every cell of her body. And she had a complete purging of the samskara. She said, I had a very powerful experience of the divine after the diksha. She becomes a witness to the immense misery that is caused by the karmic mind. And she watched the entire life as a detached observer. Her resentment just dropped away, 
resentment for her father, for her husband, and her life had dropped away after the process, and she settled into deep peacefulness. She went home for the night, and then she woke up in the morning, and she went to brush her teeth, and she looked at the mirror. And in so many years, she felt, for the first time, she felt she looked so beautiful. And she smiled. And for the first time in 20 years, she said, both my lips rose together into a smile. And she said, as I'm speaking to you now, my speech is very clear. There is no drool. And tears are flowing down from both my eyes because usually it will be only one eye that cries, but the tears. What happened to her was a liberation from the karmic pattern and a healing of the facial paralysis. She has, she said, she was sharing with the people that she has tasted unperturbed peace the whole day. There was a great vision that was born into her, a vision of total enlightenment. The karmic mind, the liberation that this lady experienced is just one of the three dimensions that you wake up from in the field of awakening. Sometimes this karmic mind can play out as patterns of lack, of insufficiency that is flowing from not your life, from your ancestors. At the field of awakening, you are liberated from the prisons of the mind. You experience a witness consciousness. And I wish that you you continue to journey from this become a seeker to be totally liberated and journey towards awakening and enlightenment. I don't know your time frame. I know it's early morning in India. Do you have a few minutes to have some questions? Definitely, yes. Awesome. yes. First Beautiful. question I would actually like to ask, could you... Uh, just share with everybody, for those who don't know, the mission that you are on right now. Thank you for asking that. The vision from ACOM, the vision of Sri Krishna Ji and me, is to have 80,000 enlightened beings on this planet. We believe when there is there are 80,000 enlightened beings on this planet. We see that there would be a phase transition in human consciousness itself. 80,000 is 0.001% of humanity. It is like having 80,000 Buddhas walk this planet. And that is our vision. And that is the reason why I travel all over the world, lighting the fire of awakening in people across different nations, different cultures, different religions, to journey towards enlightenment. I lead seekers through retreats. And then seekers come here to have that incredible journey. It is a four-week journey called Tapas that leads an individual towards total enlightenment. So our vision is enlightenment and awakening of humanity through the enlightenment of 80,000 individuals. Mm, so beautiful. And when... One follow-up question with that too. I would love if you could share the different stages leading up to enlightenment. Beautiful. 
we see it as a five stage path. Five stage path. The first is being conscious. You're conscious of your words and your actions, knowing that they are impacting the world around you. You belong to an interconnected web. And our words, our actions are impacting the web of life. That is the first stage. The second stage is where true spirituality begins. That is, you become aware of your state, which leads you into performing those actions or using those words. Say, you hurt somebody, you're aware of your state of greed or ambition that led you into performing that. Or say you are kind and loving you're aware of your state of gratitude or appreciation or joy that makes you perform those actions that's the second stage third stage is where healing happens if you look at the world large part of the population live large part of their lives in a state where one is totally preoccupied with them, themselves i'm not talking about selfishness i'm talking about being self-centered where your thinking is revolving only around yourself. In this third stage, it changes. There is a transformation that happens. There is a healing that happens in the heart where you experience a profound connection with people in your life, with life, with earth, with everything around you. That's the third stage. The fourth stage is awakening. Awakening is to have, in its simplest terms, it is to wake up. It is to wake up from the deep slumber. It is to wake up from the prison walls of the mind. It is to wake up from the compulsive movement of your mind towards your past and your future. It is to have a glimpse of enlightenment, whereby you become a true seeker of enlightenment. How many times I, I put in words in terms of what enlightenment is and what that state is, Unless until you have an awakening into that experience, you, too, you, you do not become a seeker until then. So that is the fourth stage. You have a profound experience. And the fifth stage is that enlightenment itself, where there is a total cessation of suffering, where every form of suffering ceases to exist or every propensity that leads to suffering is weeded out of your consciousness. It is a state where identities have dissolved. It is a state of experiencing pure bliss, being one. In the journey, a tapas that happens in India, you have a powerful liberation from all the suffering and all the entanglements that keep you in suffering. And then you experience, on that pure consciousness, you experience states of great peace, great compassion, great love, and great delight. These are classical states of enlightenment. So the fifth stage is where you're totally freed of suffering. All forms of identities have dissolved. All fears and all cravings have dissolved. You are established in pure bliss. You're established in being one. That's the fifth stage. I don't know where you are, but you, you should reflect on it and see where, where you are at this point. And definitely journey towards complete liberation, journey towards total enlightenment. Um, a follow-up question that's reported to you is, is um, you know, just no noticing cycles of life. When someone reaches enlightenment, are they there forever? Or is there dips where they dip back to awakening? Or like, like are, are there... Are there temporary states or are these permanent states? When suffering does arise, um, Rogers, your awareness is built to such a great extent. You bring attention to it so quickly, even before it becomes a monster. It dissolves very quickly. Being established in that pure consciousness, every suffering that arises is more like the ripple that happens in an ocean. It doesn't stick to you. It drops away.
people who have just, we had just 600 people go through this journey of tapas here. And I just saw a question also in the chat box, if it is beyond organized religion. We have these 600 people who went through this journey together the last four weeks, who just left home this week or the last week. Yeah, they left on the 23rd. They belong to various races, various cultures, various religions. But they are united in the spirit towards total liberation and enlightenment. And once you are established in that state of enlightenment, nothing sticks to you. It is, you're more like a lotus leaf where no mug can stick onto it. No dirt or no filth can stick to it. That is the closest analogy that I can bring to an enlightened being. And like all parts of our life, you know, this, this journey is a spiritual practice. Life is a spiritual practice, you know, and, and the practice means every day, you know, we're going to be given blessings um, to practice, right? And those ble <laughs> blessings come in the form of triggers or upset or like these things that in the past might have caused us suffering. We're like, oh, what a beautiful gift from the universe. It's another invitation to practice. <laughs> and I want you to consider like what life looks like if you don't look at triggers as problems, you don't look at, at as problems or as a reason to suffer, but instead you look at problems as a gift from the universe to invite you to practice more right and it shifts our experience a little bit to, to like say oh wow thank you universe thank you for loving me so much for giving me this new opportunity to practice each of us is being invited to show up and to experience the world in a different way which is why the work that Sri Prigigi does is so important, why the work that we do is so critical is because all of us, you know, in awakening to our spiritual purpose, like the world is asking us to, to step up and to align more fully with truth and source energy. And, um, and to be able to dedicate time like this is really, really, really critical. And I, I, my soul wants to celebrate you.